Welcome to SCOTUScast, a project of the Federalist Society for Law and Public Policy Studies. Our contributors join us from around the country to bring you expert commentary on U.S. Supreme Court cases as they are argued and decisions are issued. The Federalist Society takes no position on particular legal or public policy issues. All expressions of opinion are those of the speaker. Thank you for joining us for this post-decision episode of SCOTUScast. I'm your host, Spencer Karen. On January 25, 2021, the Supreme Court decided Henry Schein, Inc. v. Archer & White Sales, Inc. The question presented was whether a provision in an arbitration agreement that exempts certain claims from arbitration negates an otherwise clear and unmistakable delegation of questions of arbitrability to an arbitrator. This case arose out of a dispute between two dental equipment sales companies. In 2019, the Fifth Circuit decided two questions. First, it concluded that the company's contract called for an arbitration of the, quote, gateway question of whether a dispute is arbitrable. Second, it concluded that a court, rather than an arbitrator, should determine whether this particular dispute fell within an exception from the contract's arbitration claim. The Supreme Court dismissed the writ of certiori as improvidently granted. Erica Berg, partner at Nelson Mullins, and Richard Faulkner of counsel at Bennett Injury Law, join us today to discuss this ruling and its implications. Hi, my name's Erica Berg. I'm a partner at the U.S. law firm Nelson Mullins, Riley, and Scarborough, based in the Atlanta and Jacksonville offices. My primary practice is commercial dispute resolution in courts and arbitration. I also serve on the American Arbitration Association's large and complex panel, presiding over business-to-business arbitrations, both as a sole arbitrator and chairing panels of three. I've also litigated a number of arbitration issues in state and federal court. I'm joined today by Richard Frockner. Rick is a Dallas-based arbitrator and mediator. In his past, he's also been a judge and a professor teaching alternative, alternative dispute resolution, both domestically and internationally. Rick has arbitrated and mediated hundreds of disputes, is a contributing author to the American Bar Association's book on how arbitration works, the sixth edition, and he's a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators and even trains new international arbitrators. We are together today to talk about Henry Schein versus Archer and White Sales, Inc., round two. The Supreme Court held, even by pandemic standards, a pretty lively oral argument in early December. The focus of the debate, for the most part, was on a question on which the Supreme Court did not grant cert, namely, whether by incorporating the American Arbitration Association's rules, had the parties clearly and unmistakably delegated the question of whether a particular dispute was arbitrable to the arbitrators. Afterwards, we all engaged in a lot of speculation as to how the Supreme Court was going to tackle the question, given that they had not granted certiorari to answer it, indeed had denied certiorari on that question. But I'm not aware of anyone who predicted that the Supreme Court would do what it ultimately did in late January, dismiss the writ as improvidently granted, or as I read on the SCOTUS blog, they gave it a dig. That same day, the court denied certain piercing versus Domino's Pizza franchising LLC, which was pending from the Sixth Circuit. That case raised the question of whether, in the context of a form employment agreement, is providing that a particular set of rules will govern arbitration proceedings without more clear and unmistakable evidence of the party's intent to have the arbitrator decide questions of arbitrability. Thus, one question which has hounded arbitration followers either remains in limbo or has been decided, but it's a little unclear. So, Rick, how would you describe what the Supreme Court did when it dismissed this case? The Supreme Court did two things. One, it left us all in purgatory. And secondly, it admitted on one of the rare occasions that it ever does that, that it did something wrong, which was uh, to, you know, grant the writ in the way that it did. Uh, What we really have here is a very peculiar 10-year odyssey of two trips to the U.S. Fifth Circuit Court of Appeal on arbitrability and two trips to the United States Supreme Court, after which they arrived at the conclusion to punt 
And so we're all right back in purgatory trying to figure out what exactly do we make of a series of cases across the courts of appeal that now are opening the door for arbitrability contests. Uh, The court in the oral arguments had some very blunt, direct questions One, about the actual language of the Federal Arbitration Act and what in counsel's position was supported by what actually is written in the FAA. And that's a first one, since most of the FAA jurisprudence has been made up by the Supreme Court on its own. Uh, What is really even more interesting to those of us who practice in the Eastern District of Texas is that our rocket docket usually resolves cases in a year to 18 months. And by the way, this case is now back on Chief Judge Gilstrap's docket. With the rocket docket, the parties could have saved probably nine and a half years of litigation and (laughs) litigation expense. Indeed. Wow. So so what is up next in this particular case? So it's back with Chief Judge Gilstrap? Yes. And Judge Gilstrap is himself an arbitration scholar. Very few people realize he was a fully qualified international arbitrator. Uh, and mediator and has quite a bit of experience in this area. So the parties are going to get yet another very well-reasoned decision. Now, one or more of them may not like it, perhaps all will not like it, but there will be a basis for yet another uh, review and exercise of his decisions by the Fifth Circuit and potentially by the Supreme Court Um, Hopefully, the parties will decide that after a decade of sparring about preliminary issues, perhaps uh, the better wisdom would be to resolve this case. Um, You know, can't (laughs) imagine clients would be very happy with paying for this. Yeah, yeah, you kind of wonder, you kind of wonder that you've been litigating for 10 years and you're not even out of the gate yet as to where the dispute's going to be decided. But, you know, it sort of seems interesting to, to me as well, and maybe it should be obvious, but why is it so important to some parties to ensure that the arbitrator is not deciding his or her own jurisdiction over their dispute? That is a critical issue for many of us, and it's critical because Uh, The arbitrators, one, frequently are not necessarily matched in experience to the subject matter in dispute. That is especially problematic in the intellectual property, trade secret, and insurance Mm -hmm. areas, especially uh, reinsurance issues, which I sometimes deal with. And there's also the the problematical area of the arbitrator's own self-interest in always finding arbitrability. Uh, I believe you do trade secrets and intellectual property as I have. I do. And Mm -hmm. we frequently remove from arbitral consideration issues pertaining to injunctive relief, much as what happened in Shine 2. And therefore, we don't want the arbitrators involved in considering or granting temporary restraining orders, temporary injunctions, et cetera. Because we need to be able to get to court, get to court quickly and have an enforceable order backed up by the penal authority of a real court. Right. I think think to that point, like a lot of people probably don't realize, to your point, Rick, that an arbitrator can't do anything to enforce his or her own order. You still have to go to court to get it enforced. So if you're arbitrating injunctive relief, which was the genesis of this case then you're still having to go to court and you're still fighting all that. You might as well just go to court once and get it done. Exactly. When I was a trial judge, uh, you know, my orders would be followed or else. The or else was well understood by everyone. Uh, I have the pleasure of being married to a district judge, and I can assure you she has zero tolerance for parties that disobey her orders. And, you know, it's critical that you have that enforceability, what in international law is referred to as penal authority or imperium. And consequently, there's no point in going to the arbitrators for this. Now, do the administering organizations have an interest in offering, quote, emergency arbitration? Certainly. But at the end of the day, do you have anything that is immediately enforceable? And the answer is if you don't go to court, no. And by the way, all the major international and domestic arbitral rule provisions allow you to resort 
to a district court for preservatory or injunctive relief without violating the agreement to arbitrate. And very few people realize that, and that didn't come up in the Supreme Court discussions. Right. And it's interesting that it didn't because of, because of the other issue that we're really talking about today, which is this, this incorporation issue that that was, you know, that was front and center during oral argument. You know, was it a clear and unmistakable delegation of the authority when the Supreme, when um, the party said that they would use the AAA rules? I don't think, I don't think they thought about it, right? I, I've called that notion preposterous, quite frankly, that, that my drafting partners in the corporate world were thinking, oh, well, I absolutely want my arbitrator, who I don't know yet, to decide whether they have jurisdiction to decide the rest of the dispute. Um, it's, it's, I agree it's, with you on that. And quite frankly, uh, you know, the reason we got here is a misapplication of the international arbitration doctrine of competence, competence. And yes, that's with a K, not a C uh, right. in the original German. And that, those cases are inapplicable to American domestic arbitrations because there you had the most sophisticated of international players advised by arbitration specialist counsel determining who and where they would go when there was a complete absence of a trustworthy national court. Remember, mm -hmm. in the international context, you frequently do not have a court or any court of the parties that anyone would trust. Right. And so right. it is necessary to employ the competence, competence doctrine. But in the U.S. domestic context, it makes absolutely no sense. Now, I kind of have to do a little bit of a confession because I may have created part of this mess when I drafted the original language that became Renaissance Center v. Jackson. But there, frankly, I was addressing a similar problem, which was that then Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals was irremediably hostile to employment arbitrations. And so I drew in the competence, competence doctrine with the hope that I could keep the Ninth Circuit out of my client's business. I had no idea it would metastasize into this mess. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Rick. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks well, at least it keeps us lawyers busy. That's true. That's true. It does. It is. So, so where you know where is the 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 line right now for the federal courts? What do how do they line up on what I call the incorporation issue? Where you know I choose JAMS <laughs> rules or I choose AAA's rules, and therefore they have the jurisdiction. Where are the, where are the courts? The uh, courts of appeal are pretty uniformly. Uh, in favor of incorporation by reference, no matter how obscure. But now that this has come forward, one, the Fifth Circuit clearly uh, is set up to reconsider this issue. Secondly, now that the bar is advised that this is a real problem and that there are other problems inherent in mere incorporation, I think that any counsel who see that there is a legitimately arguable point on arbitrability would be well advised to challenge it. Uh, you have uh, cases such as um, a Third Circuit case in which the court itself has described this conundrum as relating to the, the um, mind-bending question that is, quote, the queen of all threshold issues, unquote. And <laughs> there, the Third Circuit Court of Appeal this recent June uh, effectively found that the court had to decide arbitrability. And if you get into the jurisprudence, if you research it all the way back down, you find that the federal courts of appeal are circularly citating to uh, a decision that is from uh, the First Circuit in 1989, Apollo Computer versus Berg, where the First Circuit held, but without any explanation, that an arbitration agreement's incorporation of the International Chamber of Commerce Rules 8.3 and 8.4, quote, clearly and unmistakably allow the arbitrator to determine their own jurisdiction, unquote. Well, that was the sum and substance of all of the research. Note two things. One, there is no other research behind that. Two, it was the international rules, which has zero legitimate applicability to domestic arbitration. 
Mm-hmm. And in addition, there is a, another area that has arisen and is going to be something for all counsel to consider in federal court, which is the complete lack of full and uh, uh, disclosure of the repeated and significant monetary self-interest of both arbitrators and arbitral administrators in determining arbitrability. That was addressed by the Ninth Circuit in the Monster Energy case of uh, last year. But what is even more interesting is the U.S. Supreme Court denied certiorari of Monster Energy, where an award was vacated because... A JAMS arbitrator did not disclose an ownership interest in JAMS. Now, if arbitrators are determining arbitrability, clearly they have a financial self-interest in the continued fees from that case. And in Commonwealth Codings back in the 1960s, the U.S. Supreme Court found a requirement to make full and complete disclosure of repeated and significant financial interests and in business of $12,000. I suggest that if $12,000 was sufficient to vacate an award at the U.S. Supreme Court level, it may be again. And how many times have all of us Uh, litigated or arbitrated arbitrability issues where the arbitration fees dwarf a $12,000 fee. You can't even get the door open for $12,000 in many disputes, right? The the standard fee, standard fee for the AAA, for the most part, uh, I think it's over a million dollars, $7,700. So then you, you get beyond that. And when you get to the arbitrator's fees, you're talking tens of thousands of dollars. Oh, yes. 60, in, 70 thousand uh, dollars. Employment it, arbitration, there was a study recently of California cases in which the average cost of an employment arbitration before a single arbitrator exceeded $60,000 in arbitration fees. And when you add in council fees, it is frequently far higher than that. So much yeah. of arbitration being faster, more efficient, and more cost effective. Uh, I mean, these issues are all ones that, that adept counsel are going to be able to explore. Uh, and it's, well, what and it's, it's worth, Erica, I uh-huh. had a set of, of cases years ago on form contracts in which arbitrability was questionable. We challenged arbitrability to the AAA arbitrators over 100 times, and we received a favorable ruling finding no arbitrability in exactly and precisely one case. Yep. That doesn't surprise me. I wish I could say it surprised me, but it doesn't. Even when I've had a very clear contract issue and you say, I have a dispositive motion. I've got a contract issue. I've never had a dispositive motion granted. Never. And I, um, in one issue, one instance as an arbitrator, I would have granted it, but for like one fact. I was really, really close to granting that dispositive motion, but I've not seen it. I've not seen anybody get a dispositive motion done. So, and that goes to that same issue of, you know, look, arbitrators' interests um, oftentimes are even consciously or subconsciously motivated by ensuring that people have a full and fair hearing and their pocketbooks. Yes. Um, It's problematic uh, at all levels, domestic and international, Um, And quite frankly, it's partially why I generally favor uh, three-member arbitration panels, because typically at least one of the arbitrators will be a bit of a gadfly and, you know, push the issue of, you know, are we getting this done, decided right? Sometimes I'm that gadfly. And quickly. (laughs) (laughs) Same here, same here. And quickly, right? Yep, yep, yep. But it's interesting. Yeah, well, interesting. So we kind of diverted, but... You know, interesting, going back to this incorporation issue, well, the federal courts have lined up under Apollo and said, sure, you know, you choose the AAA's rules, you choose JAMS rules, they say they get to decide their jurisdiction, um, off you go, they decide that as well. But the state courts haven't been as completely aligned, have they? No, you, not you, at all. And, which is uh, interesting. The South Dakota uh, and Montana Supreme Courts have been unimpressed by the legal scholarship, in quotes, of Apollo (laughs) 
and the related cases. And there is a case that has been working through the Florida Courts of Appeal called Doe versus Airbnb, in which this is an issue. And there is a really good analysis by the Florida Appellate Court of the problems with this incorporation doctrine. And I think it gives counsel something of a roadmap in looking at is, in fact, their proper incorporation. If you think about it, nobody thinks about arbitrability. I mean, you and I and a few other folks may, but for the most part, business people never think about it, and they use most of the arbitration form clauses. Even many drafting counsel don't. It's not something that, you know, gets up and says, hey, pay attention to me. This is a critical issue. Nobody thinks about it until the issue has, you know, squarely fastened its teeth into your ankle. Right. I do advise clients to make sure that they include a a clause that the arbitrator may not, if there's a challenge to jurisdiction, obviously the arbitrator may not decide his or her own jurisdiction. And that case is Doe versus Nat, and it's out of the Florida second uh, DCA, and it's March 2020 for anybody who might be wanting to look it up. Um, And it does a good job. It does do a good job of talking about these issues. And, And it's interesting that the advocacy the, the courts in the state court level are more open to listening to this than the federal courts are. And it's also interesting because it's based and it goes back to this oral argument, because I know you heard this, too, where I think it was Justice Alito was asking the question, now, where exactly did you get this preference and this this, <laughs> you know, presumption from where, where does that come from? And, and, you know, counsel was just a little dumbfounded for a moment because he's like, I don't see it. I don't see and it. it's not there. I mean, it's not there. Simply, it's not there. So we, we've talked about it a, a little bit too about talking to folks who find themselves um, in a situation where they might want to challenge the arbitrator's authority. What what kind of attacks do you see? So we see generally attacking their authority to do it. Um, somebody needs to brief, right? Somebody really needs to brief the Apollo issue that this is all. You know, it's all sewn out of whole cloth here. There's nothing, there's no substance behind it. Any other thoughts about methods of attack that people? Yes, I think that some of them were outlined by Professor Berman's uh, brief and Professor Scully's Mm -hmm. brief uh, in the U.S. Supreme Court. But we go back to what the U.S. Supreme Court has repeatedly said that does have a foundation in arbitration law, and that is that state contract law doctrines are the absolute basis for determining whether or not a contract exists. Uh, That was true in the Ocampombo case where they sent uh, issues of Georgia law off to Germany for arbitration. And so any opportunities under the domestic state law or the law of the contract, if it is specified, Uh, open the door for legitimate potential attack. And then engrafted on that, counsel probably should attack delegation and arbitrability determinations and raise not only the fact that there has not been a clear and unmistakable grant of arbitrability to the arbitrators, but also raise the conflict of interest issues that have been outlined in some of those briefs, because none of us would allow our clients to go before a tribunal that had a self-interest in the outcome of the case. Uh, right. You know, part of why we have international arbitration, because unfortunately, in many parts of the world, that is precisely what we were faced and precisely why the doctrine of competence, competence, it, you know, came into existence. And right. You know, having been a trial judge, I assure you, I'm not looking for extra cases. Every time the clerk opened the door, they brought more work for me. It was not like we were, you know, underwhelmed with work. Quite the contrary. So judges want to make these decisions, make them uh, reasonably, correctly, and send them out the door. We have no desire to hold on to a case. And I'll venture, if you talk to any federal judge or state trial judge, the last thing they really desire to do is to hold on to a case they don't need to hold on to. 
Right. But they need to, they need to make, they also need to make the decision. And yes. instead, instead what we get, and we see in our case law in Georgia here is that, uh, you know, judges will rubber stamp whatever comes their way. And we've seen uh, Judge Branch was, uh, she was on the Georgia Court of Appeals and now sits on the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals. And, and she made clear, like, this is the, our job. We have a job here when it when these issues come to us and we need to do that job. <laughs> we need to do the job. We need to look at it um, rather than just saying there's a presumption in favor and, and move on. Um, and so it's, it's challenging. An elected judiciary in Texas is that uh, it's much less likely that summary judgments or a, a you know, basic uh, you know, rubber stamping it will happen here because those judges know they're going to face the electorate uh, and the bar in two years or four years or six years. And so uh, anyone who just does a rubber stamp is going to guarantee themselves a challenge. It's not yeah, so we don't, it's, some. It's, we all it's, are human. Yeah, it's, but it's interesting. We're, we're elected. Our judges are elected, but they there's never a challenge. And certainly, so you certainly wouldn't get anybody uh, all up in arms on an arbitration issue. Uh, so I'd love to think that we'd actually have some some challenges that the the judge isn't is too slow or not doing their job, but that that's never going to happen here. Um, so let's leave our listeners with some tips on how they can avoid spending eight or nine years fighting about where they're going to have their claims heard. You got sure. some tips for us? Uh, I do. A couple of things. One, drafting. For God's sake, pay attention to the drafting. A single sentence properly drafted would have eliminated the entire decade odyssey that became Shine 1 and Shine 2. Second tip is do not ever rely on an arbitration organizations language for arbitrability. Uh, the triple A's has monumental defects. Uh, Justice Kagan effectively gave jams a shout out by quoting from the jams language. But even then, if you're drafting an agreement, absolutely specify what you want arbitrated, who you want to arbitrate those issues and consider even more carefully the issues that should not be arbitrated, injunctive relief, uh, various things in the in the trade secret, competition, non-competition, or uh, intellectual property areas that are necessary for protection. Another p- important point is uh, make sure that your language excluding issues from arbitration also exclude the arbitrability of those issues from arbitration. So you have a trial court making those decisions and determinations. Uh, And one of my final tips is think carefully about who should be the parties. Do you want bilateral arbitration or do you want multi-party arbitration? Or do you wish to preclude and prevent multi-party arbitration? What happens uh, in the event that perhaps consolidation is desirable? If you get into the weeds on the rules of the administering organizations, some purport to allow the arbitrators to order consolidation. Uh, This has become a problem in that some adept counsel have found litigation funding slash arbitration funding and have brought thousands of arbitrations against Postmates, DoorDash, and others that, you know, the initial deposits, I believe, in the Postmate case, I calculated at exceeding $60 million. Uh, Amazing. Think about these things. Your client yeah. would not appreciate it if you commit them to tens of millions of dollars of arbitration fees and expenses in the employment arena where, AAA and JAMS impose 99.9% of all costs and expenses of arbitration onto our business clients. Uh, So these are things that need to be very, very carefully thought about. Um, And frankly, it's an opportunity for all of us to go back to our clients and say, hey, look, we need to have a serious conversation about what your contracts say, what arbitration provisions exist in them, what we want, who we want to arbitrate, what we don't want arbitrated, 
how many arbitrators? Uh, you know, and, and consider seriously exactly what is good and not so good about arbitration. And the last point I would leave everyone with is very much like uh, King George in the play Hamilton will be back. <laughs> It will be. It will be. It, it, this issue is certainly not going away anytime soon, um, it, particularly if the litigators uh, and the people out there challenging arbitration continue to pound uh, pound the drum on it. Um, so maybe we'll see something. I mean, I was disappointed that they also denied cert in uh, the Domino's case because I thought that you know that one was clearly presented. It was the only question presented. But hopefully there's a couple more on the horizon that will bring it back up. If we can get I some, agree with you on Pearson v. Domino's. I was really hoping the Supreme Court would take that one. But now we actually have an opportunity to formulate very carefully the attacks and defenses on this incorporation doctrine and on these arbitrability issues. And hopefully we will have a case or cases that will present the issues in a way the U.S. Supreme Court will take them and give us guidance, assuming, of course, that it's relevant because I noted that earlier this week, the latest iteration of the Fa- uh, Forced Arbitration and Justice Repeal Act has been reintroduced mm-hmm. in the yep. House of Representatives by one of your Georgia congressmen. Yeah, Hank Johnson. Yes, and it will pass the Democratic House. Now, whether it gets anywhere in the Senate, I do not know. But small businesses are going to be interested this time because the costs of a single arbitration can bankrupt a small company. And I've had it happen to some of my clients. And so small business is now uh, really going to have to pay attention to these issues, which is another good reason why we lawyers need to be talking to our business clients. Yeah, they don't. And and many, many business people don't realize the cost of arbitration. Uh, They don't they don't necessarily know what they're agreeing to from a process standpoint when they agree to it. And that, you know, it's interesting. There's the FAIR Act and there, the ABA is also now considering a resolution in its platform. So I think it's going to the House of Delegates where it's going to be in support of business arbitration, doesn't address employment or civil rights litigation um, or arbitration of civil rights claims or consumer claims. But, you know, I think that, if that employment, if the FAIR Act, FAIR Act would probably do Postmates and DoorDash some favors, right? Yes, it would. would (laughs) would. Being involved in some of the ABA's activities on that, because I'm on the arbitration committee, um, you know, we're actually returning to what arbitration was in the 400 BC range when merchants were agreeing to use arbitration for mercantile disputes, so that right. they didn't have to rely on the local king. And if you think about it, arbitration has taken about 2,500 years to approach returning to where we started from. <laughs> on that note, thank you so much, Rick, for, for joining me to talk about this issue. Um, it's been a lot of fun thinking about it and talking about it. And, and maybe we'll have reason to get back together and do, a, do another one to talk about what's, what's happening in our courts with arbitration. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for listening to this episode of SCOTUScast. SCOTUScast is a project of the Federalist Society, a not-for-profit educational organization of conservative and libertarian law students, law professors, and lawyers, founded upon the principles that the state exists to preserve freedom, that the separation of governmental powers is central to our Constitution, and that it is emphatically the province and duty of the judiciary to say what the law is, not what it should be. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast series, including SCOTUScast and Practice Group Podcasts, on iTunes or Google Play. For an archive of past podcasts, as well as audio and video of past Federalist Society events, please visit our website at fedsoc.org slash multimedia. That's F-E-D-S-O-C dot org slash multimedia. This has been a FedSoc audio production. 